Do you know that we approximately spend between 17 and 20 years in school? How often do you think about that number? Somehow we don't even become aware of the fact how big of an impact education has on all our later behaviors in life. If I were to describe how I saw the education in my early age, then I would say to you that I often thought about one definition I have learned in my biology class. Do you remember what is the definition of a cell? You probably do, and it goes like this. Cell is the smallest structural and functional unit of an organism. I was trying so hard to learn that definition by heart because professor asked us to do so, that I never really understood what it actually meant and I never felt brave enough to ask. And we were only fifth grade of elementary school. When I came to the Belgrade Open School, first as a student and later on as an employee, I realized that not all education needs to be like this. This is a classroom in Belgrade where two or three times in a week young students gather and they're willing to spend their afternoons learning and discussing about various topics that are not exclusively related to what their formal education is. There is around 30 of them each year, and they come from at least 10 different faculties. And they are part of the Future Studies program, program that is designed for the best students of the Belgrade University, and program that is there to develop their knowledge and skills in up to 20 different disciplines. And I've experienced this program myself, and later on I've been working on its development, and I realized that there are some small changes that could be introduced into the system of formal education so that we actually make a change in a process of shaping a student that is to become a bearer of a change in our society. In my opinion, these changes should include changes in teaching methods, introduction of the multidisciplinarity, and development of responsible students. When it comes to teaching methods, lately there has been too much discussion uh, on the changes that should be applied in a usual classroom setting, so that actually professor changes its position from the top of the classroom to its middle, enabling himself in that way to both teach and learn from the students at the same time. This picture here has been proving for 25 years now that the position of a professor in the classroom has a large impact on the way the lecture is going to be taught. And maybe more importantly, it has a large impact on the discussion between the professors and students. These students here are those best students from the Belgrade University, active ones with good grades, highly motivated for self-development. And yet, many of them have confessed to me that they have a problem approaching their professors directly and asking them questions about everything they don't know or want to know more about. And now we can discuss it. Yes, there are too many reasons for this kind of situation. But in my opinion, the position of a professor in the classroom while he or she is giving a lecture has a large impact on this problem. From the moment professor enters your classroom, somehow his or her authority becomes the most important part of that one's class. He's there to ask you whether you can properly absorb and repeat a specific lesson prepared for a specific class. And somehow he is always in front of you, whether you sit in a first or last row. And in that way, he never becomes a partner in your learning process. And that is a problem. I recently spoke with a young student that is interested in enrolling in our program and she asked me what kind of exams she could expect besides the enrollment exam. And I said none, explaining her other commitments we expect our students to fulfill, class attendance, working with their mentors, finish, finishing internship program, etc. And I added that those commitments are there not to be graded, but to be accomplished in the best possible way. On her face, I saw on a shock and questioning as I have seen before when other students approached me with a similar question. I'm not here today to tell you that I think that exams and grades should be omitted from the system of formal education. I don't think that. But I do think that the way the grading is perceived must be changed. In our experience, when you give a student a specific task and enough time to work on the way he or she is going to solve it, then you get a student that actually fully engages his own creativity and unique approach in solving that task. And you don't remind them that they soon will have a new task. Finally, since we do this with a group of students that are coming from different educational backgrounds, we developed a rule that whichever topic is discussed, 
different teaching methods must be used. Group discussions, group discussions, presentations, case studies, etc. And before each lecture, professor is familiar who the students in the group are, and students are familiar with the professor biography, knowing each other very well. In that way, each lecture is prepared in, in a way that everyone can be included. But maybe, maybe more importantly, in that way, students and professor feel familiar with each other, making it a lot easier to start a conversation and ask questions. And what is really interesting at this part it, is that actually it takes only two emails to do this. I've been working on this, not a whole working day. Now, let's add multidisciplinarity to this. We are, we are aware that virtual reality, Internet of Things, blockchain, uh, artificial intelligence are creating really major changes in what today constitutes a fourth industrial revolution. And young students are part of the educational system that do not have an adequate answer on this. The same World Economic Forum suggests that there are some skills we need to master during our elementary and high school in order to better navigate throughout, throughout our lives. And those skills are people management, creativity, negotiation, coordination with others, emotional intelligence, um, etc. creativity, yeah? And a very nice list, I would say. But somehow we are witnessing that not even university programs teach such skills throughout its curricula. Lately, I also feel that there is sometimes too much discussion about how creative and innovative we should be, and how to achieve that. But really, one cannot help to ask himself how to awaken that creativity, especially within a young student. I think that offering a opportunity for a multidisciplinary approach to the students has a great influence on this. If, in that way, you give a student an opportunity to understand that he or she actually has other perspectives to use, that there are some other disciplines and some other methods that could be used in solving a specific problem. Whenever I think about this, a great book comes to my mind. Uh, Howard Gardner, Five Minds for the Future, especially the part where he explains the concept of synthesizing mind. He reminds us that often we are overwhelmed by the information we get without being able to actually differ what is important and what is not. If our educational systems had a multidisciplinary approach, then we would develop individuals who understood all those information and who are capable of coping with this information in an efficient way. But maybe more importantly, we would develop individuals who would be aware that information is not there to be learned just for itself or for the better understanding of the next one. Information is a mean for a better informed practice. Now I will share with you some data because I think uh, it could, it, they are good to support what I've been telling you so far. Uh, at the end of our program, for several years now, 70% of the students rated the overall quality of the program as excellent. 83% of them said the same for the way they, they were gaining knowledge and skills. And what fascinates me the most is that actually this kind of approach raises a motivation within a young person, making them actually people who love spending time learning and discussing new things. At the end of the program, on the anonymous evaluation, 100 of them, all of them, said that they would participate in the same program again. Now, how do you develop the concept or the responsible student? Our story, the story of my organization, has a line, has a title, and that is not for school, but for life we learn. And that is not a story about great students, different teaching methods, various disciplines. That is a story about specific set of emotions and values. That is a story about people who actually understand that they are being educated for something more. That is a story about network that is carefully built and nurtured. Network of people who actually use its knowledge and skills in changing their own environment. We do not learn for school, and yes, we do learn for life. If our educational systems understood this and implemented it, then we would develop individuals who are responsible for their own environment in every possible way.
At this point, I really think that our educational system could learn a lot from the civil society organization when it comes to this matter, especially the society that is in transition. Now you can say, wow, this is great, what a nice story, but how to really implement all of this into our system of formal education? Here I would like to draw your attention to a specific method that actually exists in both formal and non-formal educational system the one and only, and my favorite, evaluation process. Whenever we wanted to change, adjust, adjust, adapt, or innovate our program, we firstly discussed it with our students. Then we asked them to anonymously fulfill some of the evaluation regarding the program and, our, and its content. Then we repeated this process with our professors, with some of our coworkers and some of our partners. And we make changes immediately. We make the results available online, so that is a strong reminder you don't want to mess this up for the next generation. And the idea 25 years ago when we created the program up until now is the same, and that is to have and to be able to offer a academic, challenging, and professional program. Program that is designed only for students, not for professors, not for government, not for any possible third party that might be interested. In that way, you put the student back in the center of the education, and then you can fully focus on additional and advanced development of their knowledge and skills. I wish I could share with you the fact that after the evaluation at my university, some changes were made. Or at least I wish I could share with you the fact that I'm familiar with the results of these evaluations. If that were the case, um, then I would probably not be suggesting that this is the method future education needs to implement. Once again, I do believe that the way I perceived the definition of a cell had a large impact on the way I understood education in my early age. Let's remind us again, so that we never forget, cell is the smallest structural and functional unit of an organism. But let's imagine and assume that education is a large and complex organism. Then let's imagine for a minute that we could be a part of this organism, that we could be its cells, large or small. Think about the impact you, as individuals, have on this organism that is so live and complex. As soon as you become aware of that, then you are immediately enabled to make some changes, to improve it, and make it more suitable for the future. We all are. Thank you.